Well, hi everyone, um, welcome and thank you for joining our webinar today titled Fine Particle Characterization and CMP Slurries with Fluorescence Correlation Spectroscopy. My name is Julie Chen Nguyen and I will be monitoring those questions and comments in the background. We will have a Q&A session in the end where you can pick our speaker's brains all right, so it is my great pleasure to introduce you our speakers today, Dr. Ed Ramson. He's a professor at Bradley University, Mun Legowski Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and his co-speaker, Tim Holt, and um, he is our Applications Manager located uh, on the West Coast in Portland, Oregon. Okay, and Tim is going to open. So, Tim, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Please go ahead and share your screen. Okay, uh, so we'll begin the webinar uh, today. As uh, Julie mentioned, we're looking at uh, fine particle characterization and CMP slurries uh, using a fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. Uh, this is Professor Remsen's specialty. Um, uh, so he'll, he'll go through uh, some details and, and some work that he's been doing. And uh, after that, we will... Um, uh, add a little of our own work, uh, kind of uh, Professor Remsen's work inspired, and it's kind of a natural extension of that work using some of our uh, metrology tools. Okay, so our presentation content today, it's, uh, so it's a potentially mixed audience, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about CMP for those folks who aren't familiar with the application. Um, we'll go into particle size variation, I'll look at a basically a simplified abrasion model. Um, we'll go into our motivation and scope, so more on uh, kind of the CMP relevance, the relevance of the particle metrology. Uh, so we'll look at process variation, we'll look at kind of the roadmap focus for fine particle focus. So we have IRDS and we have a semi-standard. Uh, so that'll be the kind of introduction and then we'll go into the two techniques. And so the first will be uh, Professor Remsen covering uh, FCS uh, uh, using fluorescence uh, and then uh, I'll go into uh, NTA using fluorescence. And so to start with a brief description of CMP, um, and very simplified here, it's a lot more complex than this, but basically to give an overview for, for those who aren't familiar, um, during our layer by layer manufacturing process and semiconductor devices, we'll, we'll encounter uh, a step in the process where there's a, a material overburden. So if we look here, it's kind of colored like copper, which is a good example for CMP. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll start with this overburden material, which kind of protrudes from the surface, um, and it, it's a polishing step, so it removes the overburden, uh, kind of frees up these features uh, of interest, uh, leaves a nice flat surface, which allows us to continue the process flow and build up the next layers. Um, so if we look a little more closely at the CMP mechanism, um, <clears throat> there's basically a, a slurry, which uh, contains liquid, typically water, uh, additives, depending on the, the application, which type of CMP we're at, and, and particles. And uh, the intent, so kind of the chemical portion of CMP, um, is to chemically modify the surface. So uh, modify the surface that's being actively polished and allow this abrasion to occur. And so we have, we have a polishing pad which engages these abrasive particles and kind of drags them along the modified surface and gets us to this nice planarized state. Uh, it's quite a dynamic process. There's, there's a lot going on here. Um, and, but today we're going to really just focus on particle metrology, so looking at these particles. Okay, and this is a, again very. This is probably uh, an oversimplification, but uh, just to give some perspective, uh, we'll look at this this uh, abrasion model. So if we look at a, a typical particle size distribution, um, we have our, our medium particle size. We have this main peak here, um, and most of the abrasives that are engaged in the process. So if we look here, is a pad and a, and a wafer. So the pad is soft and the wafer is hard. Um, most of the abrasives here are going to be uh, engage in what we'll call the, the normal abrasion, the polishing process. Uh, so these these are you know the, the majority of the abrasives in, in the in the slurry. Um, as we look here, we have larger particles and these are well well characterized uh, the effects of large particles, uh, detecting, characterizing, performance, etc. Uh, these typically will cause a scratch on the wafer. You can see right if this is our normal abrasion, this is really stands out and will cause a pretty big gouge in the wafer. Um, well, what we have on the other side, which is kind of really, oh, I'll say it's kind of neglected, maybe uh, we consider these nuisance particles in the past, um, these smaller particles are what we're going to focus on today, and these can be very difficult to measure um, because they're so small. Um, basically, uh, in, in some instances, they can be 
a useless filler, you know, not really participating. Um, but as we get to smaller and smaller particle sizes and also smaller and smaller uh, features, uh, these may become more important. So if, if the uh, amount of these particles are varying you know, significantly, uh, it can have some impact, uh, you know, basically depleting. If these are a large concentration here, we have less of these. And so it can impact uh, some, some polishing parameters, um, basically depleting these abrasives. Uh, it can remain on the wafer post-CMP. Uh, so small, small defects. Um, and this high surface area in some formulation, some uh, conditions, you know, we can see this potentially reacting because it's very high surface area reacting with uh, some other additives you know, kind of in an uncontrolled way. So uh, maybe not always a problem in the past, but certainly potential problem as we uh, get to more and more complex uh, features. Uh, <clears throat> so a little more of our, our motivation and scope. So if you look um, at the basically the supply chain of <laughs> uh, particles, so let's start with the supplier uh, of, of just particles. They'll send it to a slurry supplier. So the slurry supplier will probably typically do a dilution, put in some additives, do a filtration step. Uh, this will go to uh, you know the, the factory or the fab, where it goes into a distribution system. They, they may do an additional uh, dilution. They may add an oxidizer depending on the application and they may add some additional filtration steps. And then this goes to the, the polishing process. Uh, typical uh, process parameters are removal rate and uniformity, uh, defects could be monitored, uh, planarity is also something that, that we could look at. Um, and so when there's a kind of a commercial slurry and a commercial process, um, and sometimes we get variation. Uh, so if we, you know, if we're looking at a, a single parameter, we have a specification limit, Sometimes a lot of abrasive can be tied to an out of control uh, condition, and this may cause defects, might cause any one of these. Um, so it could be tried back to maybe a slurry lot or maybe even a specific uh, particle lot. And so if we look at this, we get a single lot that's really causing a lot of problems. Uh, oftentimes, the specifications for all of these will be good. So everything will be in spec, but we have an out of control condition. And so as we provide new metrology, um, it allows us to be reactive to problems here. So if we have new metrology, uh, we have a problem here, it can help us to figure out what's what's going on, what's wrong, and find a root cause. Um, it also allows us to be proactive. So if we're implementing uh, new metrology here to better look at particles, we can kind of make a reduction in variation we can see here by making uh, you know more robust uh, abrasive products, more robust slurry products. Uh, and overall, you know, our real motivation is to avoid this this kind of horrible condition here. So, so if we also look at the uh, IRDS, so looking kind of at a roadmap perspective, uh, we can look at uh, the IRDS 2020. This is the yield enhancement report, and so they have a typically have a list of difficult challenges. Uh, if we look at the 2020 report, and we see uh, slurry particle characterization uh, listed, and the issue is insufficient metrology capability. If we look at the previous one, the 2018 version, we see a similar uh, similar statement there. So we really feel uh, there's, the industry is calling for perpetual improvements to particle metrology. And similarly, if we look at the latest semi standards, and there was in the American Vacuum Society CMP user group meeting back in April, there was a review of this uh, this actual standard and. Uh, you know, there's a lot here. It's kind of busy, but this is this is kind of the standard for measuring PS, measuring reporting PSD. Um, the two techniques that we're covering today, FCS and NTA, neither neither are listed, but they do acknowledge the needs uh, going forward. So again, this kind of roadmap perspective, uh, several statements in there. But basically, what they're asking for is uh, sensitivity in the nanometer range and smaller bins in the nanometer range. So, you know, we really feel like this, uh, the work that we're doing is relevant to meet these, these needs, both process control and uh, roadmap perspective. And so if you want to visualize the problem uh, that we're trying to solve here, if we look at a kind of traditional particle size distribution here in black, um, as our mean particle size, you know, approaches our resolution limit. So we will see a particle size distribution like this and it kind of looks normal bell shaped. Um, but if we're not really capable of measuring what's going on for these smaller particles, we really have, have no idea what's going on. We're basically flying, flying blind, right? And so uh, we really want to work to improve these uh, resolution of fine particles. 
So that's our, our motivation and scope. Uh, so today, I mean, we have our kind of traditional methods here of uh, particle size characterization. Uh, today we'll, we'll present two fluorescent enhancement techniques. So uh, Professor Remsen will uh, present fluorescent, uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, we'll say FCS probably from now on. Um, and so you'll see his findings are very, very, very interesting, very nice work. Um, and that, that work uh, has led us to do some kind of natural extension of what he's found. We have a, a, an instrument called the ViewSize 3000, which is uh, nanoparticle tracking analysis, NTA. And uh, our specific view sizer has the ability, because it's multi-wavelength, to do some fluorescence measurements. So we can kind of take the trends that uh, Ed has characterized, uh, Professor Remsen, and uh, we'll, we'll do a little follow-up presentation after his work. Uh, so with that said, um, I'll send it over to Professor Remsen. Thanks, Tim. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Ed Remsen. I'm at Bradley University. I'm an analytical chemist. And I've been interested in the study of particles for quite some time. And I want to thank Hariba for the opportunity to present this work for you today. And I'd like to start with just an outline of some of the topics I will discuss. So Tim, if you could advance, thank you. So the first thing I'd like to do is give you an overview of the FCS technique and talk about the use of multiple dyes in this um, type of analysis and then move on and talk a little bit about how these dyes uh, are used to generate characterizations of adsorbed silica abrasives and it that would perhaps be in a CMP slurry and then turn our attention to the characterization of the small particle tail that Tim alluded to in his presentation that being a kind of a tough area to do but a very essential area recognized in the roadmap that he, he presented. And then I think I have one more here that, yeah, we'll do some conclusions and set some directions for future studies. Okay, Tim, if you would. So let's begin at the beginning. What is FCS? What is fluorescence correlation spectroscopy? Just to give you a little historical background, it's, it's a single molecule spectroscopy technique. It did not grow up in the materials world, our world that we're talking about today, it really grew up in the biological world where there was need to characterize proteins, nucleic acid, relatively small macromolecules in solution. And subsequently, it translated itself to other fields such as the characterization of colloidal particles that we're discussing here in relationship to CMP abrasives. But before we talk, talk about that, let's consider this thought experiment. So if we were doing a fluorescence study with a conventional spectrometer, what we would see here are the fluorescent molecules all diffusing around inside the focal volume of the, of the spectrometer view field. And that's what the little red dots with all the arrows mean. There's a random process of diffusion. And the dotted line would indicate that the diameter of the focal point of the instrument that's observing the solution in, in the sample cell. Well, we're obviously not looking at one molecule at a time here, but we can sort of change the game a little bit if we, to, instead of imaging through a typical fluorescence spectrometer, let's say we use a fluorescence microscope with a high numerical aperture lens and confocally image through a pinhole. Well, now we can reduce that focal volume to a very, very tiny size on the order of about a femtoliter and now, if our solution of fluorescing molecules or particles are on the order of, in the one to say 10 nanomolar range, what we will see is most of the time that little area inside the dotted, the dashed line will be empty. But other times it will have a fluorescent molecule or particle diffusing through it. So we'll see a burst of fluorescent photons detected, say, with an avalanche photodiode detector. So in essence, we're doing a single molecule spectroscopy measurement, but it doesn't mean we're seeing just one molecule in a solution. For example, here on the left is just a more diagrammatic visualization of this type of experiment where we have, again, the fluorescence microscope, the laser is, is focused into a solution cell full of, of, of particles and particles are diffusing around as they diffuse through the focal volume they fluoresce the light is 
emitted. It goes back through the high numerical aperture lens. So this is an epifluorescence type of setup, an inverted fluorescence microscope setup through the pinhole and imaged at the avalanche photodiode detector. If we look at what's going on inside that focal volume, we see this these two panels on the right where we have the shape of the focal volume, which is roughly ellipt elliptical, corresponding to the point spread function of the microscope. And molecules or particles that are fluorescent will diffuse through that volume. And while they're in that volume, they will fluoresce. Once they're outside that volume, where they will no longer fluoresce. And the typical kind of volumes here, as you can see, are, have the, these kind of dimensions if we were to represent it by, a, say, a cylinder, a two micron long by 0.8 micron wide cylinder. And if we do the math, calculating the volume of that cylinder, we get one femtoliter. So it's both a combination of low concentration, intense fluorescence, and diffusion through the focal volume of basically one fluorescent species at a time that gives this technique its single molecule spectroscopic character. So what do we do with this data? This is in all interesting, but how do we analyze it and distinguish one fluorescent species from the other? Again, here on the left, what you see is a head-to-head -head comparison of the focal volumes that, again, and if you had a fluorescent molecule diffusing through that volume, what you would see because of the small size, a pattern of rapid fluorescent bursts very, very short time in between. By contrast, if we had a bigger particle or say a di, silica dye, uh, excuse me, silica abrasive particle functionalized with some sort of dye, what we would see is not just a dye, not just a particle, we would see the complex that is the adsorbed dyes fluorescence and the, the fusion of that species that functionalized or, or derivatized particle would be characterized by again by a burst pattern but with a much long, lower frequency so we'd see basically lots of bursts for free dyes but not so in, in a very very short amount of time whereas for a, a bigger species we'd see very fewer bursts but but with a much longer separation in time well we can crunch this data in such a way these histograms these photon histograms into an autocorrelation function and that's shown here on the right. So there's the definition of the normalized autocorrelation function. And what we see here is it's a pairwise correlation relative to the average fluorescence. And we generate from these, these, these histograms, we generate two decay curves. The red curve corresponds to the fast diffusers, the small species like a free dye, whereas the blue line, the blue decay curves corresponds to a particle, for example, that ca is carrying a fluorescent dye attached to it, so it will decay to much longer time, and the time tau on the x-axis is called the correlation time, with g of tau on the y-axis is the value of the autocorrelation. So how do we, what do we do with that? So now we've taken this burst pattern, created these decay curves. What we can do then is actually extract from these decay curves important molecular parameters. So for example, on the left, you see again the two decay curves and the characteristic decay times tau d and for both the, the small diffuser in red, the big diffuser in blue. They're very different values. The big diffuser has a longer characteristic time. We can plug that value into that equation at the bottom, which is the characteristic equation for three-dimensional focal volume inside a solution. The other thing that we get in this equation, notice, is n, where n is there and it then corresponds to the average number of fluorophores in the focal volume. So we can see by, by measuring, if we go to the top there, we can see that tau d is related to the diffusion coefficient, whereas n is now related to the average number of fluorophores. So the beauty of this experiment is not only do we get a diffusion time or diffusion uh, co uh, constant like tau d coefficient, which can then be related to a specific shape, of the diffusing molecule if it's a sphere, which very often would be the case, of course, for an abrasive particle, we would get the Stokes-Einstein diameter, the hydrodynamic diameter. But in addition to that, we will get the number of those species in the focal volume. So we're getting a measure of concentration, how much of this diffusing species in there. So it's a two for one experiment. You get size plus concentration, which is very convenient for the, for the study of these kind of behaviors. So what I've shown here is some represent in this slide is some representative results we've obtained over the 
past several years working with lots of different systems. And what, just to give you a heads up, on the left here is the normalized autocorrelation function showing the overlay of free dye. And this dye in this particular case is rhodamine 110. Rhodamine 110 is one of our favorite dyes, but it's not the only one by any means, but it's one of our favorite ones for silica. And if we were to mix that with silica of size of say 70 nanometers mean diameter, we make this mixture, three rate percent silica plus 10 nanomolar of the dye and at about with a little bit of salt added roughly around neutral pH. What we see is the autocorrelation function for the free dye, which is the black dots, is decaying more rapidly than the autocorrelation function for the mixture of the silica plus the dye. This is the telltale giveaway sign that tells us we have tied up or adsorbed some of the dye onto the, poly onto the particles. So how do we crunch that data? How do we extract parameters? We can easily calculate the number of fluorescent species in the focal volume by the y-intercept of this curve. We can calculate the, core, the, 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 the characteristic to decay time, but we can also have the ability to use more sophisticated models. So on the right, what is shown is a, a model that assumes a continuous distribution of diffusing species. That is, we're not saying the particle has just one size. It has a distribution of sizes. This is a method of maximum entropy fitting, which has been described for the analysis of fluorescence correlation. And you can clearly see that Gaussian looking type of curve there on the right with a mean particle size of about 68 nanometers. And then there's a, a tail that comes down to the smaller end and climbs way up. That's the fraction of free dye. So this solution is actually not a all derivatized or functional dye functionalized particle. It's a mixture of some free dye and adsorbed dye. And this type of analysis can tell us that. This is the very sophisticated end of the analysis, which we don't often use unless we really want to see the shape of the distribution. We don't have to go quite to this level of sophistication to get useful parameters about the interaction between the dyes or the or the or about the particle size distribution. Okay, so the question that we've answered recently is can we expand the number of dye molecules that we use in this type of analysis? And what I've shown here are some relatively recent dyes in addition to rhodamine 110, which is shown there in the middle, that we have been working with in an experimental mode. And what you'll notice about these three dyes is they all have basically the same kind of core structure. They have that fused three ring system onto which a, another aromatic ring is attached to the central uh, ring of the three ring system. This is rhodamine. This molecule is rhodamine molecule. So what we're looking at here are different functionalized rhodamine. So around the rings, we have different pattern of substitution of functional groups. So on the left is alexafluor 488. Alexafluor 488, you can see, has sulfonic acid groups. It has a carboxylic acid groups. This we, we regard as an anionic dye, because, for example, at neutral pH, all these protons would be, de all these groups, a sulfonic group, the carboxylic group, would be deprotonated, and the net charge on this dye would be negative. By contrast, if we go to the extreme right, now we're looking at rhodamine 6G. You can see the sulfonic groups are gone, the carboxylic groups are gone, and all we're really left with are these amino groups, which are additionally functionalized with, with, with propyl, or in this case, ethyl groups, propyl groups. And what we this we consider a positively charged dye because all the negative charges have been removed. So you might think right off the top of your head, if you had a negatively charged particle, like a silica particle, say, at neutral pH, this would be a dye, rhodamine 6G, that would have a very strong affinity or adsorption to that surface, where by contrast, the Alexa 488, perhaps because of the presence of all those negatively charged functional groups on the ring, would have a much weaker adsorption. And in between here is rhodamine 110. It kind of splits the difference. It has a positively charged dye uh, groups, the amino groups, but it also has a carboxylic group. So in this vitrionic form is one representation of this. So you would think this would have an intermediate kind of binding affinity with silica. But the important point here is that we can tune the dye 
to the abrasive. So we know we're using a positively charged abrasive. We could use a negatively charged dye. By contrast, if we're using a negatively charged, like silica, we'd use a positively charged dye. Okay, so the key here we wanted to establish in this research, could we use these dyes interchangeably? And that brought us to the actual measurement of these dyes themselves. And what I've shown here is an overlay of the normalized autocorrelation functions, FCS autocorrelation function, of a constant concentration of Alexa 488, rhodamine 110, and rhodam rhodamine 6G. You can see the curves, the decay curves, all lay right one on top of each other. What this tells us is that the hydrodynamic diameter of these free dyes, this 10 dyes and 10 nanomolar solution, all just about the same. And if you do the calculation based on a Stokes-Einstein model, they come out at about a spherically equivalent diameter of about 1.2 nanometers. So that's the low end, as low as it goes is 1.2 nanometers, but that leaves a lot of room above, all right? So we're talking about 10 nanometer particles. We have nearly a tenfold excess in size relative to the free dye. Okay, so let's step forward here. And here's, we start looking at some examples. Here's the, the, the adsorption or the FCS curve where we have adsorbed Alexa 488 on a PL2 uh, sol gel high purity silica. And we can see we're using about five nanomolar of the dye, five weight percent of the PL2. Recall that the dye is has this negatively charged surface. It's negatively charged. This is again just just under about pH seven and a half. So what we see here is again in black dots we see the autocorrelation function for the free dye. When we make the mixture, let it equilibrate, which is very quick. We see the red decay which is, doesn't look like it's very much bigger in size, but this indicates to us a much weaker adsorptive interaction between the particles and the dye. In fact, in a minute, we'll see the resulting molecular, the particle size distribution analysis. If we step forward, what we'll look at the next dye, here's rhodamine 110. We looked at this as an example earlier, previous work. Again, under the same conditions, 10 nanomolar, same particle, much, much stronger binding. We see the decay curve, the autocorrelation function for the mixture is decayed with a much longer characteristic decay time than that of the free dye, indicating a much stronger interaction, which is kind of what we predicted, with less negative charge on the dye. Okay, we'll take one more step forward here now we look at rhodamine 6G. Remember, rhodamine 6G was the dye we posited that would be the strongest binder, a positively charged dye. Very clearly see, again, that, that red curve has shifted to much longer time than the, 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 there's the pure dye. And in here, in fact, we're seeing what looks like, you know, the presence of multiple multiple curves overlapping each other. In fact, we're probably seeing not only just the, the monomeric form of the silica. We're probably seeing dimers, trimers, or some sort of aggregates or agglomerates of the particles as well. So the, the takeaway from the comparison of these three different cases is that we can tune, the, the again, we can tune the adsorptive effect, event to the particle by choice of our dye. So now let's take these data, these autocorrelation functions, and reduce them to, to numbers, useful numbers that describe the particle size distribution. So again, here we have black, red, and blue. We have the three different dyes. And what I've done here is I haven't done a continuous fitting model here. We've done a much simpler fitting. We've done, we've assumed that the, the actual distribution can be represented by a two component fit. That is free dye and bound dye or adsorbed dye. So in that simplest approximation, we very clearly see if we look at the diameters here, what we, we see right away is that there is a, at, at, for Alexa 488, we see a diameter of about five and a half, six nanometers. That's bigger than the free dye itself. The free dye is about 1.2. So what we're, we're learning here is that the dye has a specificity for the smaller particles. Now, again, the, 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 there's a significant amount of free dye here, 84% free dye. So that other 16% is bound and it's bound to the smaller particle part or whole fraction of the 
the distribution, which is kind of interesting. So we've tuned in to the smallest particles. If we jump to rhodamine 110, now that longer decay curve is giving us a size that's much more characteristic of the mean size of this particular uh, silica. We jump to about 57 nanometers with about little less, maybe a little less free bound dye. And finally, if we go to rhodamine 6G, now we're starting this, we jump up to 71 nanometers, which is the width as the size of the bound fraction, the, the particle plus its bound or adsorbed dye. So now we're sampling a lot of much, much more of the particle size distribution in addition to species that silica species are not just perhaps one individual particle, but perhaps dimer, trimer, tetramer clusters of, of, of the particles. So the, the FCS technique gives us this ability to kind of pull apart the distribution in terms of sizes and surface chemistry. That is the chemistry at the surface of this particle is, you know, can be can be titrated with the right the right particular dye, whether it's positive, negative, or something in between. Okay, so go ahead, Tim, if you would step forward. So we asked ourselves the question, could we kind of improve our resolution of different in different regions of the particle size distribution? So we started experimenting around with using this technique after we centrifuge mixtures of the particle and the dye for specific sp speeds and at specific specific time. So we're coupling sedimentation with this technique. So the basic idea is we'll make these solutions. And here we're using a, a what we call S3. It's a, a, another sol gel silica into which we have mixed rhodamine 110 again. And what we're doing is we're centrifuging them, them down. And what we, you show here is an overlay of the normal, normalized autocorrelation functions and at a constant rotor speed. So this is just a laboratory microfuge, which is operating at its top speed of 14,500 RPM. And we're centrifuging as a function of time. So the experiment I want you to imagine is a one milliliter solution in a centrifuge tube, which is, centrif which is a mixture of the, the dye and the silica, which is centrifuged down for this amount of time at this rotor speed. And then what we'll do is we will separate out the supernatant that is, we'll take off the top half milliliter of that spun down solution column and analyze the supernatant. So basically we're discriminating against the big particles and we're trying to zero in on just the small particles. And the analysis shows this does indeed work. So if I don't spin down at all, I get a, a size of, of 46 na nanometers with you know about 92% of the dye free. By contrast, if I, spin for 20 minutes, you can see I've knocked down almost all the particles, so much so that they're overlapping the part, the, the fluorescence correlation curve of the free dye. The diameter now is only about 1.6 nanometers compared to the free dye 1.2. They're so close, we can differentiate them. So we don't have a two component fit, but at 10 minutes, you can very clearly see that again, we are sampling the the lower fraction. So clearly, if we had gone to intermediate speeds or if we had slowed the rotor down, we probably would have been able to see lots of additional mean particle sizes for that supernatant. Okay, so that's not the only way we can do this. We can do this another way. And I, I just alluded to it in a second. What we can do is we can spin for a fixed amount of time, in this case, 60 minutes, and we can run at different rotor speeds. So again, same experiment, one milliliter centrifuge solution column that's spun down, it's a mixture of the dye plus the R rotamine 110 plus the particles. We, we will spin it for this um, at this speed, these different speeds for 60 minutes and then siphon off, pipette off the upper half mil. And once again, if we look at the comparison of the autocorrelation functions, you can see at 2,500 RPM, that is low speed, low field, we have dropped the particle size from about 50 nanometers down to about 41. So I've only dropped out the highest particles and we're sampling the bulk of the particle size distribution. If we do a second spin at 4,500 RPM, now we've dropped down even more and we're, we're, we're isolating the smaller fraction. 
when we get to about 8,500 RPM, now we've knocked down so much of the particle size distribution, the particles in that distribution, we cannot distinguish between the free dye that is left in solution and the particles. But say 6,500, 5,000, we would be operating probably in the range between 10 and 20 nanometers, and we'd be able to isolate and analyze the size distribution in that range. Okay, so where does this leave us? Okay, a couple of things to say here right away. One of the important features I didn't talk about in any depth here for lack of time was we don't want any quenching events. That it, and we've studied the quenching behavior of these three dyes in, in mixtures with the silica. There's no excessive dynamic or static quenching events that prevent the use of the technique. So all three dyes can be used interchangeably. But the thing we notice is what we had originally expected as far as the adsorption of the dye goes, the, the positively charged dye, high affinity for the negatively charged silica. Again, it's a function of pH too. So we can tune in the pH if we wish. And again, uh, the more negatively charged dye, weak binder, positive dye, strong binder. When we couple the techniques, that is we do a sedimentation by differ in, in a differential manner, that is manner which we either change the rotor speed or rotor time and isolate the supernatant, we can, we're picking up on the small particle tail. So I could imagine a situation we could easily compare different lots of material under the identical experimental conditions and distinguish one tail from another, for example. And, and if we keep going here, going forward as a recommendation, and I think this is where the Hariba folks have picked up, we really do want a strong interaction. So rhodamine 6G, at least in our measurements, shows us the kind of desirable affinity that we would like for silica in general, and that if we have the right technique, we can zero in on the small tail, and we think it'll give us the highest possible resolution by using for this particular silica. Now, other dye, other particles are going to use other dyes, and thanks to our friends in the biological world, we have lots and lots of dyes to pick up to use in these type of studies. The final thing I want to make mention of is because the FCS technique measures concentration, again, from that fraction in the focal volume, we should have been able to quantify the adsorption isotherm of the dye in its interaction with silica and other abrasives, which means we have a direct probe of the surface chemistry. You can also think of this in terms of the abrasive slurry. The abrasive slurry has all kinds of other species in here that are going to give us problems if they might interfere, but by the same token, we could get competitive adsorption. Competitive absorption is a very, very nice thing. We perhaps can understand, get Langmuir isotherms for specific slurry chemistry that would compete with the binding of the dye. So technique's got a lot of capability and I'd like to leave it with that. And I thank you very much for your attention and I'd be glad to try to answer your questions. Okay, so we'll take uh, the questions that we had for Dr. Rimson um, at the end of the presentation. I think you can type in your questions and uh, we'll go through them at the end. Um, so thank you Ed, for, for that presentation. Uh, very nice trends here and, and we can, it's kind of, we have an instrument called the, uh, the view sizer. Uh, it's a nanoparticle tracking analysis, uh, formerly called the Manta. Um, and so we can explore some of the trends uh, that Ed showed, or Professor Remsen showed uh, using this. And so uh, what I'll do is uh, go over the, the technology, you know, what, how, how the the uh, NTA system works. Um, ours is a little different. It's got uh, three lasers that simultaneously illuminate the sample, which gives us some flexibility to explore uh, explore some of these trends. Um, and then we'll go through kind of our, our concept. So we did some testing uh, here and we'll, we'll go through that. So basically we want to enhance, uh, going back to the original scope and motivation, we want to enhance the detection of some fluorescent tagged fine particles. So that's, that's the work that we'll review. Uh, so we'll look at uh, suitable particle and dye. You can probably anticipate what that dye might be uh, based on uh, Professor Rems's work. And then we'll show a small series of experiments we did um, to have a look at the, these interactions and our ability to measure the finer particles. And then we'll go through conclusions and directions for our future studies. Um, 
so brief comparison is a bit busy, but um, <clears throat> here when we look at uh, uh, Professor Remsen's uh, presentation, uh, his interrogation volume, he's, he's capable of single molecule scale. So you can detect a single molecule and it does that. You can see individual dye molecules show up. Um, NTA, you know, kind of an extension of the ultra microscope, which was in, been around for a while, invented in 1912. Um, NTA is uh, on the scale of single particles, so he can resolve a single molecule, we can resolve uh, a single particle. Um, and it basically works as a very simplified drawing, but we have a, a focus beam that uh, illuminates uh, interrogated volume. Um, the projected scatter is detected orthogonally at 90 degrees. Um, and what you can see is uh, the image of the scattered particles move here. And so the small ones will diffuse quickly, uh, the larger ones will diffuse slowly, and from that uh, diffusion, we can we can uh, derive the uh, hydrodynamic uh, diameter of the particles. We get the particle size based on the motion of the projected projected scatter within this interrogated volume. Uh, so we can detect them by uh, the scattering intensity, and then we size them by the motion of those particles uh, within the interrogated volume. Um, so this is what the modern system looks like. So this is the view size of 3000. Um, it's got three laser sources, uh, and we'll go into why it has those and the benefits of those in a second. But basically, these these uh, simultaneously illuminate through a series of I mean, optics here, uh, illuminates our sample, um, and then through another series of optics, so we capture that scattering motion with the high resolution camera and some video capture. Uh, so this. Videos are then analyzed for the motion of the particles and we, we get the sizes. Um, so why why three three lasers? What's the benefit? So when we look at scattering cross-section here, so this is a, the, basically a scattered image. Um, we have the particle diameter. Uh, we have a red, a green, and a blue laser. And you can see basically the limitation of the red laser uh, is somewhat limited to larger particles. Um, as we add the green laser, we, we increase our resolution uh, quite a bit uh, and then when we add the blue laser uh, we really increase our resolution quite a bit more and so the three lasers gives us a wide range of particle detection um, here's a video and uh, hopefully everybody can see it well and so this is going uh, the colors are added you know to help distinguish the particle sizes really to illustrate the different lasers um, so we can see initially we see red we see a few particles kind of slowly moving around uh, we can see the green laser added which uh, you can see smaller particles in kind of the empty space the, um, where the red were and then when we add the blue if you look you can really see some very small very fast moving particles in there and so this is this is uh, the color is added but basically this is the the video that uh, uh, is captured by the tool and then analyzed uh, to get the particle sizes. Uh, and so our distribution, particle size distribution, looks something like this. Um, so this is these are actual counts. So these are counts per bin. Uh, and so it's not uh, estimations of a fitted curve. It's actual counts per bin uh, of a discrete volume. So we're able to get counts per milliliter uh, nanometer bin scale. Excuse me. And so the benefit here, um, you can you know, capture more video to get more individual counts and get closer to your uh, true particle size distribution based on those counts. Um, and this is a bit busy, but it's a very good uh, example. So the, kind of the intention of, of developing this product was to overcome some limitations with, uh, with other uh, uh, particle sizing techniques. Uh, and so, uh, again, a bit busy. I've drawn it twice here. This is uh, the comparison of our technique. So if you look here, the black dots are TEM images. Um, the red line is this kind of classic uh, NTA. Uh, the green line is our uh, Manta or View Size or 3000. Um, and then we have overlaid three different uh, DLS techniques. So um, you can really see uh, over here, good agreement between uh, the Manta, the view sizer, and the classical NTA uh, within a certain range. Um, uh, on this side, as we get a bit larger, uh, you can see where the NTA falls off. Um, so the intent here was to kind of overcome that, that limitation with three lasers, as we showed in the, the previous slide. Um, and you can also see here where the you know the medium, the mean particle size uh, for the DLS measurements is 
pretty good agreement with the mean particle size for these other techniques, but the actual particle counting gives you uh, a little more information uh, on the small sign, uh, uh, fine side, and on the larger particle side. Um, another benefit of having three lasers, and this is really where we start to tie in with Professor Remsen's work, uh, is ability to uh, use a, a variety of fluorophores uh, to tag specific particles in a mixture. And so this has a lot of biological applications, uh, but this is a very good example here where you can look at a mixture of three particles. So if we just look at a black line here, uh, we can see we have a 102 nanometer particle mixed with 140 nanometer particle and uh, a 203 nanometer particle. So if we didn't apply any fluorescence to this, we just looked at the uh, <coughs> the, the normal scattering. You can see each one um, pretty well here. There is some overlap, but you can see the three peaks. Um, but if we have a, a series of uh, long pass, short pass filters that allow us to isolate uh, fluorescent species. And so when we filter out the other particles, we can clearly see uh, this particle here. So the 140 nanometer stands out, but we can get rid of the other one. So we can isolate uh, particles in a mixture. So we have the ability to uh, look at uh, in, in detail uh, specific fluorescence of, of specifically uh, fluorescing particles, excuse me. <coughs> And so a little more on the view sizer, <laughs> um, just for explanation of our experiments. So when we look at the detection limits, we have scattering uh, intensity and we have fluorescent emission. And so th this again is pretty busy, but what we have here is again, this, this where we look at the scattering cross section, so the scattering intensity, and this dash blue line is what we consider the view sizer limit. Um, and then these, these series of lines here are materials that have uh, different refractive indexes. So um, a higher refractive index will give you more efficient scatter. So you're much better scatter if your, your index is higher. Um, and so we have a series here showing the different materials. When we look in this regime here, this Israeli scattering, uh, we see that decay is, is quite pronounced um, and it's uh, tied proportional to the sixth power of the particle diameter. And so, for example, this dark blue line is silica, and you can see here we reach our limit somewhere around 40 nanometers. Um, what's important to notice is, and this this line here is uh, fluorescence. Um, um, this is not drawn, you know, on, on the scale here. It's really drawn to show the nature of the decay compared to the decay of the Rayleigh scattering. And so, this uh, fluorescent emission decays uh, much less rapidly in these smaller particles and is proportional to the square of the particle size. So where this drops off quickly, this drops off slowly. And so we might be able to see where this is going. This leads us to our kind of concept for improving the detection limits. Uh, so this is just blown up from that previous slide here. We have the decay, scattering decay of the silica reaching a limitation here. And we have uh, perhaps some, some dye. Uh, if we can uh, uh, selectively dye these particles, we would hope to improve our ultimate resolution by tagging the particles. So you have a, a scattered signal that degrades quite rapidly. Um, you have some fluorescent emission that decays less rapidly. And we hope to combine the two to improve our detection limits below you know, what, I, what we calculated around 40 nanometers. So that's a, a good setup. Um, and so we did some experiments and we found a, a colloidal silica that we think would be uh, challenging right for the for the uh, the view sizer itself um, the mean particle size is um, <clears throat> somewhere around our resolution limit and due to the aggregated nature of this particle if you look at their specification sheet they report uh, two particles they report a primary particle size and then report an aggregated particle size uh, and so this this implies that these uh, these particles are aggregated to produce the mean size. And so while most of the particles would be somewhere around 40 nanometers, which is an aggregate uh, ratio of 2.7, we can expect to see uh, dimer particles, trimer particles, uh, larger aggregates. And then we, can, we also hope to see um, some of these primary particles around 15 nanometers. So we think given the, the, the properties of this and the different sizes that are pretty clear, uh, we think it's a very good choice for, for this experiment. Um, and then for an efficient dye, obviously, um, Professor Remsen's work uh, really showed rhodamine 6G to be a very strong and efficient absorber. It's very consistent with the literature. We found multiple sources uh, where uh, silica is actually used to sequester dye from solution. So we, we, uh, 
uh, sequester cation dye, excuse me, from solutions so over detail. Uh, so between those, you know, we, we felt that rhodamine 6 g was a very uh, good choice as well. So we'll go with, uh, we, we went with uh, uh, Fuso PL1 as our, uh, <clears throat> as our colloidal abrasive, and we went with rhodamine 6 g uh, So we got those two materials to uh, Carl, our applications engineer down in the Irvine lab. Um, and he started working. So uh, we got some kind of initial condition recommendations from Professor Remsen. Uh, Carl took that and did some uh, kind of proof of concept measurements, We're basically looking at uh, a few different combinations of particle and dye. And so we're looking at here for these particle size distributions, you can see, it's hard to see here, but it's basically the x-axis we have the dye only. So the dye itself is not really a contributor to our, our particle counts, particle sizing. Um, then we have the particles only, um, here and then when we added the dye to the particle, so adding these two together, we got this result. And this was this was we expected to see something, but we didn't expect to see something this this clear and pronounced. So you see the huge shift. Uh, you know, counts are are much much higher. And then when we see, uh, we also see a shift to uh, measuring much finer particles. And so uh, as far as a first pass, this has really exceeded our expectations. We all got pretty excited about this result. Um, there are a few. Um, few little things that we wanted to uh, understand a little better here. So this particle size distribution didn't really fit what we expected. If you look at the specification sheet for the the uh, mean particle size, what we're looking with is this, this turned out to be quite dilute, um, uh, uh, very dilute sample of the silica. And we added the dye, we definitely saw some particles, but we wanted to understand uh, this regime a little better. And so we did uh, some follow-up experiments. Uh, one of them was to optimize the dye silica ratio. And again, a little busy here, uh, but when we look at uh, the black line here, well, again, first you can see the dye itself, the dye solution that we use is not contributing uh, anything significant to the distribution. Uh, when we look at the particle itself here in black, you kind of see um, particle size distribution closer to what we expect. Um, the orange line is, is relatively high dye concentration. And so we, we really don't see much difference between the, the particle and the high dye concentration. Uh, and then we get to the blue line. So this is kind of mid-level uh, dye. Uh, and we really consider this to be optimized. You see the um, particle size distribution starts to show this shape as well. So we, we think we've we've hit an optimum here as we continued to uh, even less dye, but it starts to drop off. So um, these show a, a few examples where we did, we did significantly more work here to uh, to understand this optimal level uh, and this just displays it so uh, very good a uh, very dilute initial result optim optimized uh, dye to silica ratio and then we went back again and so once we got the dye to silica worked out um, we went back and re-optimized the dilution which allowed us to then improve our optical settings and, and arrive at this this condition and so we're very happy with this one um, Again, the dye itself uh, not contributing. We start to see the particles. Even we expect our limit uh, resolution limit somewhere around here. Um, we start to see a distribution that really starts to reflect uh, what we would expect uh, from this based on the description in the uh, specification sheet. And then when we add the dye, we see a huge, you know, big, big increase again in the, the finer particles uh, that we're interested in. And specifically over here, the 10 to 20 range, we're starting to see this uh, jump up, jump up quite a bit. Uh, so very, very happy with this kind of fine-tuned condition. Um, and we go back and we look again, right? This is our, we, we think our calculated limits right about here, and that really coincides pretty well. We 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 start to see the fluorescent enhancement really make a big difference around 65 nanometers and below. And so as we start to die off with the scattering, this really kind of supports our idea that this uh, fluorescence will uh, extend our signal to smaller particle sizes. Um, and so we looked at a lot of distributions. Just to be clear, uh, maybe give a, an illustration of, of, of what we did. So we, we started with our standard process where the fine particles are poorly detected. What I've drawn here is, you know, this kind of looks like the scatter you would see in our, our video. It's, it's this is fixed, but uh, and I've drawn the yellow lines to show that we've we've uh, tracked it. So the the, the um, software has picked up the particle, the movement of the particle, tracked it, and then can size it. So we see some of the larger particles have been uh, tracked here, but we also see some of the fines not tracked. So this is 
basically an illustration of our standard process. When we, when we added the die, everything was pronounced, right? So our counts went very high, and then our, our fine particles also went uh, quite high. Um, but we had so many particles in our, our interrogation volume that we had to do some uh, further optimization to dilute these, to move the particles apart a bit so we could actually uh, trace these these smaller particles. So these are quite fast moving. If there is so too many particles in here, you kind of lose the ability to, to resolve these. And so um, this, this uh, subsequent uh, dilution and then fine tuning of the optical uh, parameters to make these stand out a little bit more once we could see them, we could we could optimize for them a little better. And so we went from this condition, uh, died, uh, and then diluted and died uh, to get this, this uh, measurement that we have now. And so in summary, um, you know, pretty much when we, when we got our dye concentration right, any time we put the dye in, we really see a significant increase uh, in the counts when we look at PL1. Um, and we definitely can see, uh, Certainly in this regime, we see, we see an increase across here, but really here we see a, a significant increase in the counts, and that's close to where that, that monomer, that 15 nanometer particle that we're hoping to see is. And so this data really supports that, that uh, concept that we had. Um, so we're seeing this consistently, which leads us to a lot of opportunities to follow up. Um, just like Professor Remsen was saying, uh, more dyes for more particles. Um, different types of particles. We have our, this uh, rhodamine 6G kind of coincided with our green laser, um, but because we have uh, three lasers, we can we can look at blue blue fluorescent and red fluorescent dyes as well. Uh, we could look for lot to lot. If we had m multiple samples of this, we could see if this is uh, showing up, this is changing much, or if this is kind of a constant, this, this uh, particle type. And then um, the process for complex slurry formulation. So this is simply particle water and dye. Um, it's a very simple system. Uh, I think with uh, some additives that go into a lot of uh, slurry formulations, surfactants, uh, et cetera, um, we need to understand who, uh, how to dye these effectively and, and, and understand what's going on with the uh, competitive adsorption, for example. Um, but you know, overall, uh, very pleased with this result and uh, we're happy to share it today. Um, so between um, Dr. Remsen's presentation and in our presentation we've shown you know the ability to go from uh, kind of single molecule detection uh, up to uh, you know an incremental improvement over kind of scattering limitations using fluorescent enhancement. So uh, we think it's really relevant to uh, semiconductor needs so the roadmap looking forward this is the type of work that can start to address some of those needs. So I'd like to thank Dr. Remsen for his work and uh, turn it over to Julie for the Q&A session. Well, thank you so much. That was a really good talk. Um, it's We only have so limited time to explain what you've done um, for the past weeks. This is definitely a really good presentation. So th thank you. So before we jump into the Q&A session, I want to draw your attention to some of the relevant literature that I uploaded. Um, there's an app note and as well as more information on the view size area 3000. So question number one, um, and feel free to jump in, Ed and Tim, anytime. Um, what are some problems of different additives and media background? Can you comment on that? Well, one thing to think about here again is that Tim mentioned it too is a competitive adsorption issue. So we know the dye has probably certain an affinity for certain sites on the particles. But at the concentrations perhaps that one would use in formulating a slurry, you know, adding corrosion inhibitors or rate accelerators or variety of things that are used in CMP slurries and it seems like they get even more chemically complex every year to tune the slurries to specific polishing requirements. The the question comes in is well can we still dye the particle? In other words, so what this where this sort of pushes us down the road of making sure that as a limitation that we always have a dye that binds to the surface of the silica with an extraordinarily large Langmuir adsorption constant. So it's not outcompeted 
by slurry chemistry. That is if we're looking at the particle size distribution. On the other hand, if we really want to understand those adsorptive events, in other words, which of the slurry chemistries, which compounds have the strongest adsorption on the particle, the particle is carried to the wafer surface. So you have the particle almost like a delivery vehicle carrying these, these chemicals to the surface of the wafer. What we could, what the, the, the techniques have the kind of potential to understand the, well, what does the wafer see in the way of adsorbed surface chemistry when it starts its polishing event at, at the surface? So by using these dyes as probes, we're, we're directly probing the surface chemistry of the abrasive particle. So you could imagine what if you use mixtures of different abrasive particles? Could you tune the slurry with ones that are really strong binders, ones that are weak binders to get a specific desired type of polishing? So there's a lots of opportunity here. It's not all problems. It's not all limitations. It's also opportunity. Thank you. Um, second question, and also can I ask that you turn on the camera so we can see you? It's, I think our audience definitely sure. prefers to see you than me. <laughs> okay, <Yeah>. now, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the next question, instead of silica particles, um, have metal particles been tested? Not in my lab. Uh, we might have some some uh, metal particle analysis. Uh, I don't. I doubt we've done it with uh, with with uh, dye additives, but I, I could uh, we could certainly check into it on the view sizer side. Um, so I'm assuming gold and, and silver are maybe of interest. But uh, if you have more detail, you can put it in the question section. We can uh, try and find some some previous results. For sure, and we can certainly follow up too if you were to email us at lapinfo at hariba.com. So I put that in the chat box too. Um, the next question, will it be able, so would it, I think we're talking about the NTA as well as the FCS techniques, would it be possible to use inline and online particle size analysis? Tim, do you uh, want to? Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, so um, I think it would be for, for the view sizer itself, um, right? It's it's it looks essentially like a spectrometer. Um, right now it's standalone. We do have there's a available uh, flow cell, or it's been used with a flow cell before to kind of simulate in line. But currently it's it's a laboratory instrument. So it's um, we are having some discussions uh, about uh, how to make this happen. But right now it's it's just available as laboratory instrument. So you could pump some something through a flow cell um, and have it analyzed, but it wouldn't be necessarily a true uh, inline measurement. Yeah, I think the same is true on the FCS side of the house. Here, the um, the, the the classical method uses a quiescent solution, but the software that are available do have the ability to incorporate a flow velocity. So we've seen this in a number of vendors. So the answer to the question is, in principle, yes. It's a relatively unexplored area, which would probably entail a lot of method development. But I think there is reason to believe there is technical feasibility. It just would take a lot of work to, to, to get it to work. Yeah, same, same here. Thank you. And then we'll just do one more question as we need to honor your time. Have you tested natural particles in surface waters? Yeah, like you're thinking, um, hmm, well, proteins are the classical, you know, kind of, but yeah, people have done hydrogels, uh, all kinds of polysaccharide type of particles, uh, core shell type of particles. Again, it, these techniques really don't discriminate against one particle versus another as long as you can dye it with the fluorescent, with the fluorophore. So mm -hmm. there's a wide range of materials outside the normal silica abrasive, metal oxide abrasive, nat if, you, what you, if that's what you consider natural particles. You know, yeah, part the, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, on the, the, the view sizer side, um, you know, it operates without dye uh, as well. And uh, 
as long as it scatters uh, sufficiently, we can detect it and track it. So uh, I'm not sure what the natural particles are uh, either, but um, certainly uh, if they're big enough and they have a, a refractive index that scatters, uh, we can we can probably uh, measure them. And I'll add that um, with a view sizer, some of the common applications may be vaccines, may be lipid nanoparticles. Um, so these are some of the biologics materials that we commonly seen here in our lab. Okay, uh, one last question and I'll wrap it up, I promise. Um, were the solution buffered? If so, what did you use? Not, we have used buffers in the past. We have we didn't use any buffers in this solution. We generally use dilute buffers like two molar phosphate or two molar tris, millimolar, excuse me, millimolar. So when we use buffers, again, we don't want the buffer salts to outcompete the dyes for the surface of the pop, but we have used buffers and they can be used, you know, very, in these particular examples, we did not. These were self-buffering, you know, the particle solution itself as received was buffering itself. Yeah, same. We didn't we didn't use a, a buffer. We discussed it quite a bit, uh, the, the use of it. So the buffer would suppress the double layer, and maybe lead to a different uh, different type of interaction with the dye and the particle. So if you, you really suppress the, the double layer, you go from electrostatic uh, to an, an instance where you might get some hydrogen bonding, um, and and the efficiency uh, was was probably a little more complex than what we wanted to address at this point. So. Um, we opted to not use a buffer in this case, but we, like, like I said, we have we have uh, we have used buffers in the past, uh, and I think I think they yeah. were just fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Remember, we're using buffer when we have used buffers. We're in the millimolar range. The dyes are in the nanomolar range. We have a million fold difference in concentration, which means the adsorption of the dye is many orders of magnitude stronger than yeah. that of the the buffer salts. Yeah. Yep. So if we, I think one of the examples was the we were considering using Nile Red, uh, which wasn't a cationic dye, and I think Ed, you had some success with that in the past, and we, we I think the right. assumption was the that hydrophobic it was, it was, dye. Yes, but it was hydrophobic. Yeah. Yeah. We thought it was uh, maybe hydrogen bonded uh, to right. the surface, uh, not necessarily yep. actually. So we, we, for simplicity's sake, and to kind of do a uh, our, our analysis. We we opted to <laughs> to keep a, a very pure particle, and not so this particle is not even sodium or potassium stabilized. So uh, certainly we could do it, I think, without any problems. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. Well, it's been such a pleasure working with you, Professor Ed Ramsan and, and Tim. Um, so for now, everyone else, please don't hesitate. Um, to reach out to us. If you can think of any questions or comments you want to share at labinfo.haruba.com. Make sure you join our newsletter by answering yes um, to the post-webinar survey or just simply connect with us on LinkedIn. It's the Particle Characterization Group. For now, have a great day and we'll see you at our next webinar on July 13th. We'll switch topic over to data interpretation. Alrighty, thank you so much. Bye everyone.